would like to introduce uh, George Jagowski. Uh, Dr- Dr- uh, hopefully, I didn't butcher that name too badly. Um, You're fine. <laughs> thank you. Uh, George is from Caltech, and he was also the co-chair of the, uh, the uh, KISS Techno Signatures Workshop. And so George is going to give us a talk on how to think like an alien. George, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. So in spite of my clickbait title, I don't know how to think like an alien, and nobody does, and we probably never will. But I will report in a highly biased way about the workshop intended to minimize the biases for searches for techno signature, which was done over a year ago, how time flies. And here is the URL. Uh, you can probably easily find it in Google anyhow. And um, well, the report, yes, it will exist at some point. So it was a very fun workshop. Some of you were there. Uh, Don was there, uh, Jason, Sophia, they certainly contributed enormously, especially Jason with his encyclopedic knowledge of the subject. We invited not just the usual suspects in astrophysics, physics, uh, but also people from fields like social anthropology, somebody who knows how dolphins communicate, and a biologist who told us how you can maybe encode fossil messages in DNA uh, and stuff like that. But I don't have, obviously, time to go through all of it. So the motivation for this was to go beyond the traditional SETI. And a lot of traditional SETI, including, so especially radio, uh, was basically assuming several things that are clearly anthropocentric for the present day. That first, that ETIs will choose to communicate, and we will and will do that with the present day, more or less, planetary technology, and in a way that we can understand. And that was certainly well explored ever since the days of Project Osma. So what we thought, we should try a new start without really any of the assumptions as best as we can. And the reason why this was worth doing is that there are now many new opportunities, thanks to the growth of the big data and also the tools to explore the big data, machine learning most of all. And of course, because of exoplanet research progress, now we know there are so many uh, planets and Earth analogs out there. So this was really the challenge we put to ourselves. How can we recognize and minimize, if not eliminate, the, these inevitable human biases that are historical and cultural and technological and so on and so forth. So we first thought like, okay, what is it that we know for sure? And the one thing that we think really is universal is that mathematics, physics, chemistry, and information theory are universal. But everything else is up for discussion. We also know that planetary systems are common and Earth-like planets are relatively common. And one thing that we're quite sure about is that all living organisms and civilizations consume energy and thereby generate entropy. They generate information so they have to pay the entropy price for it. In some sense, they're entropy sources, or other environment, they dump their excess uh, junk heat. And in addition to the information sources. So traditional SETI seeks sources of information, but uh, also we can seek sources of entropy, and that is embodied in Dyson spheres, for example. But that's not sufficient because, of course, many natural objects are also sources of entropy. And civilizations probably respond to their environment and modify them and evolve in a ways that we may or may not be able to recognize. So these are starting points, pretty general, I would say. Now, I think it's worth taking a little lesson from the past. And this is from about 100 plus years ago, where these three great inventors, Tesla, Edison, Marconi, all thought that they detected radio signals from Mars. And Mars, as you know, was very popular uh, back then. They didn't know about the ionosphere. That's why three kilohertz seemed like a good thing. And these men all said things like this. Um, Marconi not only thought 
for sure that he got extraterrestrial signals, but he even thought to use Morse code. And Tesla was also somehow sure that these signals are not coming from the planet Earth, and maybe from Mars, and Edison had his own adventure using a big pile of iron ore in Michigan. But basically all of them seem to be fairly confident that yes, there are kind of human-like people on Mars and they communicate with us at three kilohertz or so. Now these people are obviously no fools. They were geniuses. And uh, this may sound silly to us today because of everything else that we learned since then, but obviously they were heavily, heavily influenced by their cultural and technological milieu that, uh, that they lived in. And so there is no reason to think that we are not suffering from same kind of blindness that's imposed by our own development and environment. So this is in a nutshell what we think um, this might look like. There are vast amounts of data in astronomy and more coming all the time and I'll expand on this a little bit. And so first you assemble data, you federate different data sources like from different catalogs, optical, infrared and whatnot. Then you have to do data cleaning, which is approximately where about 90% of your time and effort will go. And then you apply toolkit for machine learning. And you have a number of questions you have to answer, like what kind of feature spaces you look at and what algorithms and define what's normal in order to define what's an outlayer and so on. I remember somebody once said, uh, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you have to be really good at classifying hay. And that's certainly true. Even tiny leakage of vastly more numerous normal population can create contaminants in the outlier population you're looking for. So somehow you are able to pick genuine outliers and some of them will be spurious, usually due to data artifacts or maybe processing artifacts. And this is why it's really essential that you always work with people who really, really understand the data they are working with. Uh, you can't just waltz into this field and now download some data from one of the many virtual observatory archives and apply some off-the-shelf machine learning toolkit. You're much more likely to make fool of yourself than to actually find anything interesting. So in all of the data science, and this is obviously one of the applications, this is always true. That you cannot just hand over some data to a computer scientist or just use something off the shelf. You really, really need to understand where the data came from and what can go wrong. And a lot of things can go wrong. Well, suppose you do that and you eliminated all of the junk and you found real outliers. Well, they can be in two flavors. They can be natural, something new and interesting, or they can be techno signatures. So then somehow you have to figure out which one is which. And we thought that information theory could maybe help define some criteria by which we can separate natural from artificial. That turned out not to be the case. At least we couldn't think of anything. And of course, then you follow things up. Now, this is of course what astronomers do anyway in exploring digital sky surveys. And uh, sometimes, People say, well, you have to have collateral science in, in SETI searches, but actually SETI is just collateral benefit from science that's done for other reasons, which is what makes this approach actually much more likely. So here is uh, in my one slide history of data rich astronomy. So astronomers have been always using the latest technology in order to uh, generate and process their data, starting from 1980s or earlier with first digital detectors. And then as detectors got better and larger, moving on to larger and larger data sets from individual pointed observations to sky surveys to now synoptic sky surveys that do sky survey all the time. And we marched through a variety of different technologies from image processing early on and, and pipelines and the databases and then virtual observatory came along to kind of sort all this out. And machine learning um, and now artificial intelligence since about turn of the century, well, virtual observatories 
have been operating for the past decade plus. Astroinformatics was rising as an interesting field by analogy with bioinformatics and other exinformatics. And today we're firmly in the petabyte regime and heading into the exabytes. So it was pointed out many times that the data volume in astronomy and actually in every field uh, increases exponentially with doubling time like Moore's law for the same reason, data produced by devices that follow Moore's law. It's not usually noted that a more interesting part is the increase in data complexity and quality. And both of those basically re reply, you have to use machine learning in order to go through all of the data. So here is just a quick sampling of the surveys through history in early mid 1990s. We're starting to nibble at the terabytes and now we're very much going for, uh, for petabytes and heading into the exabytes. And now it depends actually what you mean by data, because for example, in radio astronomy, there are many more bits generated at the detector than they're actually useful for anything. And we have to even think about things like data triage, which data are to keep at all. Uh, but this is happening and it's going to continue because the derivative of exponential is also exponential. The rate will increase exponentially as well. So the data are uh, really a major opportunity here. Another thing that's worth noting is that the universe looks different at different wavelengths because different physical processes generate energy in different uh, wavelength regimes. And federating data across different wavelengths, say infrared to optical to radio and so on, opens up new things. You see things in the data that were not visible, so to speak, or not recognizable in any of the data sets alone. So essentially every astronomical observation carves some hyper volume or in the observational parameter space in the area and depth and wavelength and resolution and angular resolution and temporal baselines and so on and so forth. And within those hyper volumes are different phenomena, different sources. So that's where things come, uh, how we approach this. And that is increasing all the time. These uh, hyper volumes are expanding. This is sort of like the old cosmic haystack only with many more dimensions and much more complicated. Um, and today there are many, many different surveys and different wavelengths that are carving their own chunks of this. So machine learning is the basic technology here. And for the purposes of what we're talking about, um, it's, there are really two aspects of it. There is supervised learning or classification where you have a sample of known things. So you train classifier like neural network and it finds things for you. And more interesting is unsupervised learning or clustering where you let the data tell you how many different things are present in your data and which one belongs to which cluster. And then you presumably look at those that don't belong to any known cluster. There are literally hundreds of different algorithms to do all this. And so that's why you have to actually know what you're doing and experiment a little bit. Uh, real, this very much is collaborative effort between uh, astronomers and computer scientists and engineers. But there is no clear obvious thing that you can say, oh, I'm going to use k-nearest neighbors and that'll define my clusters and I'll find the outliers. Well, we do then map these parameter spaces. We choose particular measurements. Typical sky survey will generate hundreds of features for each source detected. And they cluster usually in this feature space. Some features are more important than the others. And if you know what you're looking for, like say quasars or brown dwarfs or what have you, and you can then predict where will they be in this chunk of the parameter space, then that's how you find it. And this is in fact how essentially all quasars today have been found, almost all. But unsupervised clustering has been always the dream behind all of this. This is nothing new. Uh, we all were always motivated by this, but you cannot say, well, we're going to look for things we don't know are there uh, in your proposals, because then you're accused of doing fishing expeditions. But I think every major new instrument survey had that as part of their motivation. 
So if you have this model-based searches, then you kind of predict where should things you're looking for be, and then you look at sources which are there sufficiently far away from the masses of ordinary things like stars, and you find them. But sometimes you also find things that you didn't know were there uh, because you never had examples before. That. This is just one of them that we found very early on was object on the left that's not noise. That's a very high signal to noise spectrum. It really does look like that. And it's a particular type of broad absorption line quasars that are very rare. I'll point out now that in fact, even though we have been doing this a lot over the past 20 plus years, we have yet to find a truly new phenomenon of nature. What we have found are new, unusual, rare subspecies of known kinds of things, like different types of supernovae or things like that, but never something was genuinely new. Well, okay, so you're doing this and you're looking for outliers, things that are far away in some quantitative sense from the bulk of other stuff in your parameter space. And this is where it gets really tricky because in order to define what's an outlier, you have to understand the probability density distribution of the normal stuff. And usually people assume Gaussians, but it's almost never the case in nature. Uh, my lesson in that was when I started looking for distant quasars, when I find out, found out that 5% of all of my data points are five sigma outliers, and that doesn't work. So if you see something that's far away, some measure of probability or likelihood, it could be genuine outlier, or it could be that you have a fat tail of the distribution, and, and that's just the way it is. Well, that's where usually a lot of um, effort goes in. You have to actually follow them up and figure out what it is. So it's important to remember, this is not magic. This is part of the toolkit. You have to clean the data before you do any analysis. And again, domain expertise is essential, but you have to worry not to throw away genuine interesting outliers because they don't fit what you expect in your data. And as if you have a lot of data, a lot of things will go wrong and almost all of them will look like outliers. So this is the usual garbage in, garbage out. But there is another garbage out uh, path, which is your algorithms have some assumptions built into them, statistical or otherwise. And even if you had perfectly good data, but choose wrong algorithms, you're going to get wrong results. This is why you need the data science expertise, machine learning expertise. So machine learning itself is not biased, but it can be used in biased ways. And there are many examples of that you can go through. And it's also hard to understand why sometimes they give you the result they do. And neural networks of all kinds, including deep learning are notorious for that. that you just can't open the box and find out, oh, that's why this was classified as so-and-so. You just don't know. And that's a big issue to these days, understandability of machine learning. And in the end, in any case, however computers, accurate computers they might be, humans interpret the results. I'm always reminded of this statement from Ivan King that Statistics are like the witches in Macbeth. They never told him anything that wasn't strictly the truth, but they let him derive his own conclusions. And that's the danger with all of the statistics or data mining. Oh, so let me say a few words about Synoptic Sky Surveys, which are the, the major uh, data producer these days and across all of the different wavelengths. And there are many of them operating it's Wiki Transit, Transient Facility at Palomar, Catalina Real-Time Transient Survey, PanStars, ASAS, many, many others, many more are planned. And of course, LSS thesis, exploration of time domain as uh, one of its major scientific goals. In all of them, we get vast amounts of the data, but coping with data volumes is not so much the problem because again, computers get better according to Moore's law. But classifying things that vary or appear and then disappear remains to be a really a huge challenge. And we've been at this for like 20 years now and some progress has been made but not nearly enough. We're totally not ready to really face the data flood that's coming already from Synoptic Sky Surveys. Because how do you find something interesting? And it's 
variables you want to catch it while it's hot. That is like a whole another talk or set of talks in itself. And there are a lot of things that vary out there, natural things, some of them rather dramatically. Um, some of, most of them get brighter and fainter and so on. Um, flare stars, cataclysmic variables can have huge amplitudes and come out of nowhere below the tr detection threshold. They're bright for a while and they go away. Um, there are also stars that dim, like our core uh, stars, stars are even, you know, um, a particularly good example of that. So here is an example of how we did actually look for interesting things in parameter space. And this is some measures of variability of quasars. And we selected outliers and found there are three different kinds of interesting things among the, those outliers, including quasars that change from type one to type two or the other way around in process changing their brightness usually by a few magnitudes. So those again, could be things that appear that were not there before, not detectable, or disappear, become too dim for you to see. So the outcome of the, our uh, workshop was then uh, the following specific suggestions. First, looking for the outliers in source catalogs, federated source catalogs. This is the general unsupervised clustering. And this is what looking for the good old unknown unknowns. And this would be done by other for people for other astronomical reasons. So, specific thing that we thought we can be doing is search for generalized Dysonian structures that convert some part of the luminosity of the parent star into thermal infrared. And that can be modeled. And, and that's the one robust thing that we thought civilizations will do. And so that could be a very specific thing to do a better and more you know, improved search for Dysonian structures. And the other group of things is artifacts in a solar system, which come in two flavors. They can be free flyers on some kind of orbit around Sun or on Earth or Jupiter or something. And orbits that are somehow recognizably different from bulk of other stuff. And also in principle on the surfaces or just below the surfaces of planets or moons or asteroids with little or no atmosphere. And so we started looking seriously into those. So of course, in terms of artifacts and surfaces, we now have great training data sets on moon and Mars artifacts that we left there, but they only look like artifacts that we left there. And, but in principle, they show what something that is not like ordinary rocks or craters or something could look like in feature spaces. And people at JPL are really good at doing this kind of stuff. And things on unusual orbits. And I'll draw your attention to a poster paper by Virisha Timaraju, um, some of this work. And here is an example of a really interesting asteroid belongs in so-called uh, Apollo group which orbits the Earth and orbits the Sun together with Earth. And thanks to the wonders of the celestial mechanics, it has some really interesting orbit, uh, making these Lisa Zhu figures as it goes around. Well, um, this is probably a natural object, although Chinese thought it's sufficiently interesting that they may launch a mission specifically to go and check whether it really is a chunk of rock or something else. And that's just one example of the thing that we may be looking for in feature spaces of orbital parameters. So I'll end with, with this speculative idea. So we know the evolution tends to accelerate in time. That's true for both biological and technological evolution. And somebody once said that on planet Earth, singularity already happened and it's us. And uh, that's definitely true. And of course, the pace of technology is increasing dramatically. So we are already creating alien minds. Uh, AlphaGo is just one example. And the most important part to it is that it finds things that humans never thought of and thinks in a different way. So basically we are creating alien intelligence on planet Earth. And it thinks different from us. And it will, for sure it will surpass us, but because it thinks different, it may help us really find things that, you know, thinking like the aliens, 
assuming it's interested in doing that. So that I'll stop and thank you for your attention. So happy to answer any questions. That was an excellent talk, and I was really glad to see that you mentioned uh, the, the, the Deep Mind Go uh, player in there. That's an excellent story. Uh, we have a couple time, a couple minutes for some brief clarifying questions. Um, I'll just go to the chat here. Um, so there's a question from uh, Clement. Uh, what can we extrapolate we could do the next decades? assuming a roughly 1,000 increase in data collection per decade as you showed. Do we need to combine this with observational, such as sensors and telescopes, technological progress? I'm not sure I understand that. I mean, uh, the progress is usually in detectors. The telescopes get better and bigger, but much, much slower than anything has to do with computing. And computers get better, faster, more efficient according to Moore's law, and devices like CCDs are following the same technology. So in, in terms of following the data rates and data volumes, yeah, we're all set. But the algorithms don't improve exponentially. The software doesn't improve exponentially because it's written by people and not by machines, although we're getting into now into software written by the machines that's better and bug-free. Um, of course, we don't know uh, how this will happen. What I can certainly tell you is that we are going to create better and more complex data. And more complex is where all of the challenges come in from, like the number of features and data dimensions that you have to deal with and, and so on. And most algorithms don't, don't scale very well with any of that. So um, we are not alone. No, not just in astronomy. Astronomy is not alone. Every field, science or commerce or anything else has this challenge coming up and so essentially you have to train people to understand how to use this, these new tools. All right, we'll do one more really quick question here from Sarah. What are some other examples of false positives or false negatives for techno signatures? How could we really be sure that we found one? Or, and then related to that, can, do you think there's an overlap or similarities between biological and technical, technological evolution, and could that help us predict the evolution of technology? Um, well, those are two very good and very different questions. Um, there are some examples uh, where I can, from my own experience, I can tell you where artifacts look like something really interesting turn out not to be once we figured out what's going on. Um, a sub-question of that is, so there is a genuine outlier. How can you tell that something is natural versus artificial and you just are unable to read the message? We don't know. We actually had in computer scientists give a talk about this, which nobody understood. And I think the short version of it is, well, no. There is, as far as we can tell, there is a challenge of telling what something is obviously artificial or not. And there are some lessons to be learned from paleontology and from history, uh, like scripts that nobody can read, and things like that. But that's about it. Um, as far as the parallels between biological and technological evolution, hmm, things get more complex in time and do so much, much faster in both of those cases, except the time scales for technological evolution are vastly shorter than those for the biological evolution. And uh, what will happen? Uh, who knows? Some people like Elon Musk think that AI is a great danger to humanity. You know, he may be right, but I doubt that there'll be Skynet uh, out to exterminate us. And I think what we ought to be working towards is a symbiotic relationship with our silicon-based brain descendants. And we use AI every day through search engines and, and, and whatnot, especially if you're talking to your phone. AI is everywhere already. Uh, and so far we can control it just fine, but that may not always be the case.